Good evening. I'm Belmont Select Board Chair Adam Dash, and on behalf of the town of Belmont, I want to welcome Sabrina Fulton. We're fortunate to have her with us tonight, albeit remotely. It's hard to believe there's been 10 years since the death of Trayvon Martin. That event brought, in to, brought to light for many people an ugly truth about our country that they did not know existed. But for some, particularly people of color, it was a confirmation of what they already knew. In the past 10 years, racial violence has continued, eventually coming home to Belmont a year ago with the murder of Henry Tapia. Having these events garner more attention is better than not, but they keep happening with a depressing regularity. Sabrina Fulton is doing her part to stop that. I wanna note that this discussion um, tonight will be a, a Q&A uh, only and moderated by Kimberly Harley Jackson of the Belmont Human Rights Commission and Jennifer Burgess of the Black and Brown and Belmont and Bar. You'll be unable to raise your hand, uh, but you are encouraged to put written questions in the Q&A uh, below. Sabrina Fulton's dedicated her life to transforming family tragedy into social change. Since the death of her 17-year-old son, Trayvon Martin, during the violent confrontation in 2012, Fulton's become an inspiring spokesperson for parents and concerned citizens across the country. Her book, co-authored with Tracy Martin, Rest in Power, The Enduring Life of Trayvon Martin, shares the intimate story of a tragically foreshortened life and the rise of a movement that awoke a nation's conscience. The publicity surrounding Trayvon's death and the ensuing trial catapulted the country into a national debate. Despite the intense struggle of losing a child, Fulton has become a role model to many by turning her grief into advocacy. Remaining strong throughout the trial and ensuing months, she lends a voice to speak against violence towards children and the need to build a better, safer community for all. Her message not only appeals to people's hearts as it relates to children, but it also is of hope and change, exemplified by her personal experiences and endeavors. As a mother, she inspires audiences to continuously educate their children about civil rights and help them feel accepted as part of an ever-changing society. An honest and relatable speaker, Fulton always looks forward, Sabrina, I'm sorry, always looks forward to sharing her powerful message with everyone from colleges and legal professionals to community and family organizations and all of their proponents of social justice. A Miami native, Sabrina Fulton graduated from Florida Memorial University, where she earned a bachelor's degree in English. A proud mother, Fulton worked for Miami-Dade County Housing Development Agency for over 25 years and is a member of the Antioch Missionary Baptist Church of Miami Gardens. Again, this discussion will be moderated in the Q&A only by written questions. Uh, it will be moderated by Kimberly Haley Jackson and Jennifer Burgess. You'll be unable to raise your hand, but you are encouraged to put the written questions in the Q&A following uh, Ms. Fulton's uh, talk. I also want to call out the sponsors for this today's event, the Ashland Public Library, the Lincoln Public Library, the Morrill uh, Memorial Library, the Wayland Free Public Library, the Town of Belmont, the Beach Street Center here in Belmont, Belmont Against Racism, uh, the Belmont Human Rights Commission, and the Belmont Public Library. Ladies and gentlemen, Belmont, I'm honored to present to you Sabrina Fulton. Thank you so much. Um, do you all want me to, to just, just start talking a little bit and then you, you guys come in with the questions? Okay, um, so most of you know um, uh, Trayvon Martin, but I have two boys. I have Trayvon who is in heaven and I have a uh, Javaris Fulton who is here on earth. So uh, I have two boys. Um, they're both mama's boys. Um, I tell people all the time I couldn't have I would not have signed up for this. I would not have applied for this position. I just feel like once my son was shot down, it made me stand up. And so I try to encourage people not to wait until it happens to them it, it, and it, or it reaches their front door in order for them to get involved in social justice. It affects us all. Um, it's not just about uh, civil rights, it's about human rights, it's about gay rights, it's about women's rights, it's about children's rights, it's about animal rights, it's about people having to write 
uh, the right to live and and to you know just be in the community and not people uh harassing them or harming them because of the color of their skin or because of the way they believe their beliefs are and so um uh, like uh, Adam said, I was a Miami-Dade County employee. I worked from, from, for the government um, for several years. Uh -huh. And um, that, that position afforded me, uh, gave me the, uh, the ability to uh, raise my kids and to make sure that we had a decent life. And so um, I could not have uh, prepared myself for what I went through, um, a lot of people call it a story, but for me, it's a tragedy because I have to carry it um, the rest of my life. And so um, I, I think it's important for me to talk to, uh, continue to talk to people because as I'm ministering to people and also ministering my, to myself, um, I, I'm continuously grieving, I'm continuously um, being empowered and trying to uh, lift other people up to see past what they're going through, because a lot of times people only see what's in front of them, but I knew that better days were coming, and I knew that if I push forward, um, I would be happy again, because when this first happened, I felt like I would never be happy again. And so it's, it's about um, just respecting one another and just trying to um, understand other people's point of view. Thank you, Ms. Fulton. Um, I'll start with the first question and then um, we can go over to Jennifer. Um, you know, for many, your son Trayvon has become a symbol um, and not an actual person. Um, so, you know, I was wondering if you could tell us tonight a little bit about your son, um, actually both of your sons, um, and what they, you know, what they were like growing up. What was, what was their life like? Um, very uh, family-oriented. Um, I love babies, and so both my boys love babies. Um, they love, you know, I used to, you know, put baby oil and powder and brush their hair. And so the boys used to always try to do, uh, you know, um, take care of babies. And they really, really love babies. They really love making cookies and, you know, just the, the you know, things that kids like to do, give them chips and things like that, candy and all kind of things like that. But um, Trayvon was a, a people's person. Um, he felt everybody was his friend. Um, my oldest son, uh, Javaris, um, you can probably count his friends. Everybody is not his friend. You know, he is very laid back. Um, Trayvon was very outgoing. Um, so they, they kind of had their own different personalities. I probably would say um, both personalities probably came from me um, because some days I do like to be around a lot of people and some days I don't. So they probably got that from me. Um, very um, ambitious. Um, um, my oldest son, so one of the questions that I keep hearing is uh, 10 years later, how do I think um, Trayvon would be doing now? And I can only go by what I see my oldest son um, he's graduated from college. Um, of course, he graduated from high school, but he graduated from college. He has his own place. He has his own job. And, you know, I'm just glad that he's doing well for himself. Um, and I really believe um, that Trayvon would have went exactly in Javaris's footsteps. I believe um, Trayvon would have been, you know, a benefit to society. I believe he would have um, graduated from college by now and, and had a job in his own place and um, probably a few kids <laughs> um, because he was very friendly um, and, and he was starting to get into the girls and he was letting the girls influence him and things like that where my oldest son Javaris, that's not happening. He said kids are too expensive. But um, they both... Um, Trayvon used to eat almost everything on earth. You know, every vegetable I gave him, he ate. Where Javaris, he was very picky about what he likes and what he didn't like. And 
you know, he doesn't like butter and I love butter, you know, so it's, it's crazy things like that. But um, just growing up with them and just, um, you know, listening to, they used to listen to my songs and things that I was singing. So they had a very like old school spirit um, because, you know, when I clean up the house, I put on my music, which is old school. You know, I listen to Frankie Beverly and Anita Baker and all of those people. And um, so they were very familiar with old school, you know, um, that's probably about it. And, and, and I just was like, I was probably the disciplinary um, parent in the household where um, I used to call Tracy the Disneyland daddy because he would let them do any and everything they wanted to do. But I made sure that the room was clean. I made sure that they had their school clothes together for the next day. I made sure they did homework and they had haircuts and all of those things. So I was probably the one that was a little more stricter, but I was the one that showed more love because, you know, moms love the kiss. We don't care how old they get. <laughs> um, we love the kiss. And, um, you know, they got that from me. Wow. What a great um, representation of, I, I, I feel like I am getting to know Trayvon even more and, and Jabarius. Um, my question is, um, it has been 10 years and, um, over these 10 years, we have seen the murder of your son, um, auction off items. And I mean, the most recent, uh, judge throwing out a lawsuit against you from this monster, um, how do you handle that? How, how have you, you know, handled the, it feels like a continuation of the assassination of your son over and over again. So how do you, you know, how do you and your son and, you know, Trayvon's dad handle that? Well, I think I've heard about the lawsuit like in December of 2019 before the pandemic, um, before we knew anything about coronavirus or any of those things. And so, um, when I first heard about it, I thought it was absolutely ridiculous. Like you took my son's life and you think by, <laughs> I, I didn't really care what the court says, but I was not going to pay a penny. I, I, ju I, I just, I don't understand the whole justice system, but I, I was explained that anybody could sue you for anything. You know, it doesn't have to be justified. We just have to play it out in court. And so once I heard that from the attorneys, because we did have a team of attorneys, um, he was suing about nine, nine people, you know, he was suing the publishing companies and um, Benjamin Crump and uh, the publishing company for Benjamin Crump's book and Tracy and I and the young lady who was on the phone with Trayvon, he, he said that that wasn't the person who Trayvon was talking to. And it was just a lot of crazy things that I heard. And just to hear it over again, it was, you know, I wanted to laugh, but I couldn't, you know, I really wanted to say this is ridiculous and just laugh it off. But I did have to take it seriously. We did have to meet with our attorneys. We had to, it, it went for two, two years. It went for a little longer than two years. And, and it, it's just unfortunate that somebody could take your child's life and then go turn around and sue you for the fact that they feel that you uh, that, that was a defamation of character and that we did anything wrong. Um, we had a lot of attorneys, including the state of Florida behind us that was prosecuting the case. And so to say that we was misrepresenting the truth, um, I, 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 I'm just glad the judge saw through that. But anybody could sue you for anything, unfortunately. And, um, you know, we just had to go through that behind the scenes. So a lot of people didn't know um, that that was going on, but we had to meet with our attorneys. We had to um, talk about and discuss different things so that we can be prepared when it did go to court. Um, but hey, um, this is America, right? And anything could happen in America. Thank you. And I, I, I think we're seeing that. Um, 
definitely over the past few years and the increase of, of these crimes that have been going on. Um, you know, your presence tonight seems especially um, important given the news today of the guilty verdict of the three officers and the George, George Floyd murder. I they just found, that. I just yep, yep. Uh, they were found guilty of uh, deprivation of right under color of law for failing to administer medical aid. And two of those officers were charged with failing to intervene in the use of unreasonable force. Um, you know, so we're seeing some changes within the justice system that, you know, unfortunately, you know, did not apply in, in your family's case. And I'm wondering, you know, how are you feeling about some of these changes that are going through the, judi the judicial system? So um, I, I don't want to get, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to be too, you know, happy about what's going on. You know, I am uh, appreciative of the fact that now people are being held accountable for people's lives, for, for African Americans being shot and killed and being in a chokehold and being in a with somebody's knee on their neck. So I'm 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 glad to see that we are progressing in that manner, that people are being held accountable, they are being arrested, they are, uh, they are being convicted and they are going to jail, which is a good thing. But we still cannot ne neglect the fact that lives were lost, like uh, so many lives were lost in order for us to get to that point. We just got to stay focused about everything that's going on, not just rejoice in the fact that people are being held accountable, but also think about the lives that were lost. Because a, a couple of weeks ago, um, we had, because we celebrate Trayvon's birth and not his death. And so on February 5th, we had a big rally here in Miami and families came out to stand with us and support. And even though... Um, Brianna Taylor's mom was here. She was sleeping in her own bed and uh, the police came in. Those police officers are not, uh, were not being, that police officer was not being charged for killing Brianna Taylor, um, but for shooting in a, an apartment that was occupied by somebody else, you know? And so we, we, we gotta just stay focused that lives, so many lives were lost. Oscar Grant's um, mom was here and his aunt and uncle um, Valdosta uh, Kendrick Johnson's mom and family was here. Um, George Floyd family was here. Um, it was just so many, Eric Garner's um, family was here. It was so many families that were here um, that lives were lost. And, and, and I know that um, because I've spoken with uh, Amar Aubrey's mom, um, the pain does not leave even though you feel like you have some, um, you know, like you have some parts of what we consider justice by the mere fact that they're, they're being held accountable, if that makes sense. But Ahmad is not here. And uh, there will always be an empty table, at, at an empty seat at her table for his birthday, for Mother's Day, for Christmas, and every holiday. There will always be an empty seat, even though the, the three guys that well, the two guys that, um, well, all three were convicted and, and um, are sitting in jail now, it still doesn't bring her son back. So I, I, I do um, appreciate the fact that things are changing, things are progressing. Hopefully they stay the same. I'm impressed by what's going on now. I, I hope that people understand that lives have been lost and we have to hold people accountable for taking a life. Um, I believe that's the reason why people are nonchalant about killing um, people of color is because you didn't feel like you were going to jail. You didn't feel like you were gonna be arrested and convicted and go to jail. And so now that they see us happening, hopefully we can start decreasing our numbers and people can stop killing us and shooting us in the back and shooting us for no reason um, because it's a possibility now where, where it wasn't before that they may be arrested, 
um, and, and convicted and go to jail. I know that was long. <laughs> oh, I, I appreciate all of that. Um, you had mentioned before that, um, you know, they'd, that the murderer had sued uh, Ben Crump. And so I wanted to kind of have an idea. We see, for most of us, we see Ben Crump all over the place and for, for unfortunate reasons. Um, I wonder what, um, uh, do you still have a relationship with him? Is he still working with you um, and all these other families? Um, Absolutely, he tries to, he, try, he wants me to be his sidekick. Um, that's probably why people think of, that I'm an attorney. Like a lot of families reach out to me and they kind of ask me legal questions and I have no clue. I have not been to law school. I don't know the first thing about law. Um, I do know about right and wrong, but I don't know. I cannot uh, tell you about the laws. And so one of the first things that I tell families when they do get in touch with me is, do you have legal representation? Because it's very important. Um, we had legal representation, we had guidance, we had direction, um, we had advice from a legal team that was behind us, that was explaining everything to us, that was giving us direction on, on what we should do and what we should not do. And so I think every family, when a situation happens where there is a loss of life, um, I, I believe that every you should get an attorney, even if it's just you getting advice and counsel from a legal team, you should get an attorney. So don't try to figure out your, you know, for yourself, if this is uh, something that, that a lawyer should handle, don't try to figure it out, but, but seek the, the advice from an attorney and let the attorney give you guidance and just make sure it's somebody that you trust. But yes, definitely. He was just here uh, for um, February uh, 5th and uh, 6th for the Trayvon Martin Foundation events. Um, <laughs> he, he's, he's never gonna go away, he's family now. Um, I really appreciate all the advice and everything that he, he did for me and my family. He did more than just a regular attorney usually do. Um, and so I, I had a lot of questions because that was the first time I ever um, sat at a trial and, 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 and listened to testimony and, and evidence and things. And so I had a lot of questions. And so... Um, but, but he was very patient with me and, and, and I joke with him now and I say, don't forget about me. And I, I'll, I'll put it on social media and I say, could somebody tell attorney Benjamin Crump to give me a call? And, and his phone is ringing off the hook. You, you better call Trayvon Martin's mom. So um, he, he's doing a great job. It's probably a, a little overwhelming for him, but he just has to build his team according to the cases. And so people trust him, they believe in him, and they, you know, when, when you lose a, a child or you lose a family member, you, you're looking for somebody to help you. You just want somebody to help you. And so that's what definitely what he does. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a question specifically, um, as a Black mother and a mother of a young Black man, um, what advice would you give to the community? on how to communicate about issues that specifically affect young black males. Um, we kind of seen the commercialization of what they call the talk, right? Which is, you know, just how we as black mothers raise our sons. Um, but for people who work within various communities, especially I'll say predominantly white communities, um, you know, what advice would you give to those communities about issues that affect young black males? Well, I, I truly believe that um, education starts at home. And I, I, I um, even when my boys were younger, I probably was explaining things to them a little too much and they probably didn't understand, but it's okay because they grew into that knowledge. You know, so um, what I would suggest people to do is um, just one night a week or um, just take a look at the news and things that are happening, current events, things that are happening right now, today, um, not something that happened 400 years ago, not something that happened two years ago, but something that's happening today and discuss those 
um, situations with your teenagers, with your young people, so that they understand what's going on right now today. Um, that, that's the first thing that I would tell them. I would also, um, I, I talk about this a lot, that we see our kids as, you know, lovable. We see our kids as, oh, he wouldn't hurt a fly. A fly. But other people in, 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 in their mind may see your child in a different manner. I met a young man a couple of weeks ago. He was 14 years old. He was 6'1". Um, probably close to 200 pounds. You know, I saw him as a big teddy bear, but somebody else might not see him as a big, big teddy bear. They might see him as a threat, even though he's not. So it's all about perception. And we have to teach our young people that it is about perception. Also, the other thing is there's a lot of hatred in this country, and we got to explain that to, to our kids. Everybody do not does not love you. You know, there are some people hate you and they hate you merely because of color of your skin. But uh, it's not just about the color of your skin. It could be the fact that you are, uh, are of a certain religion. It could be the fact that you may be uneducated. It may be the fact that you uh, are, are gay or lesbian or you know, whatever, whatever your sexual orientation is, you know, people judge you by who they believe you are, and, you know, and we just have to, you know, instill in our kids that everybody does not love you. It's a lot of hate going on. It's a lot of people that are, are, have uh, judged you before they even know you. They don't even know your personality. They don't know your character and they would judge you. And so we have to get past that. You know, um, even as African-Americans, we have to get past it. Um, Caucasians have to get past it. Uh, uh, Latinos have to get past it because everybody uh, for whatever reason um, feels more comfortable with their own group. They feel more comfortable with their own nationality. But we have to understand that just like I have a child and um, I love my child, that that person has a child and they love their child. And this person has a child and they love their child. We have to understand that. We have to understand that so that we can move forward, that we can address these issues. And I don't ever believe that we're going to get rid of as much hate but I just wish it would go away. Um, you know, we don't need to see it. We don't need to hear about it. We don't need to see it. But right now, I believe um, this country, um, we see it. We feel it. Um, um, we see a lot of people being shot and killed. That's us seeing it. We physically see it. You know, and, and I believe we feel it by how people treat us and how people talk to us. We feel it. Um, but I believe that, you know, as adults, we should be mature enough to know that whatever your prejudice is, keep it to yourself. That's wonderful advice. I tell people that all the time. <laughs> right. Um, um, so I... I in your recent essay, 10 years later, you say, I can't help but wonder if the stand your ground laws were created with the legal killing of black people, especially men in mind. Um, so I 100% agree with you. I think that's exactly why that law was created, unfortunately. Um, and I wonder, um, can you speak to your efforts to overturn this law, the stand your ground laws? Um, have, has there been any success, any movement? Um, no. Um, right now, we have a Republican governor, and um, he is a avid Trump supporter, and so uh, he didn't even believe in us wearing masks um, in stores and closing areas and staying a safe distance, six feet away. You know, it wasn't enforced. You know, enough. It wasn't enforced enough. I mean, I've had a uh, home. Um, uh, three shots. I've had two shots and my booster shot. And whenever they have another shot, I'm going to take that because I'd rather be safe than sorry. But um, based on the stand your ground, I truly believe that it is not intended to protect 
people of color. Um, because when we use uh, stand your ground, it never works for us. It never works for us. Um, I'm remembering a young lady, and I believe she was in Jacksonville, and her her uh, she was in some domestic violence situations, and she shot the gun. Um, I want to say Marissa Alexander. That's the name that's coming to me. It might be right. It might be wrong. But um, she shot the gun up in the air. And she used stand your ground and um, she she went to jail. She was arrested and she went to jail on the spot. And so I think it's about, it's too gray. I think stand your ground law is too gray and it leaves um, too much room for people to interpret what they should do. Um, for people of color, that law for us means shoot now, ask questions later. That that's what that law means. It doesn't mean that you're protecting yourself. It doesn't mean that you're protecting your house or your property or anything. It's just flat out shoot now and ask questions later. Um, there are probably several laws on the books uh, that was intended um, not to protect um, people of color, but that are against people of color. Okay, thank you. And, and also, you know, I'd like to at least just make a comment that, um, you know, with the Stand Your Ground law, the Journal of American Medicine recently came out with the study that said that there was an 8 to 11% increase in monthly rates of homicide, uh, where and in firearm homicide, um, where Stand Your Ground laws are. And um, there were definitely state uh, level increases reached 10% or higher in Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and, you know, no surprise, um, Florida, you know, uh, so, so just definitely speaks to, to that. Um, you know, I want to pivot and, and sort of talk about the groundswell of um, social activism that has occurred um, with the unfortunate murder of your son. And, you know, what can these groups that are in support of, you know, Black Lives Matter, um, and anti-racism, how can they help further your cause? For those um, that are, you know, grassroots organizations. Um, the first thing I would say, um, I, I don't believe they need to continue to create more groups. I think we need to su support the groups that's already, the organizations that's already, um, that's fighting for social justice. I think more people need to participate and get involved in those groups. That's that's the first thing. And then I think we 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 all need to collaborate and we all need to organize, do a, a better job of organizing because it seems like everybody is doing their own thing and has their own entity. Um, I know that in New York, um, they have until uh, until freedom, which is, um, headed by uh, Tamika Mallory. Um, I definitely uh, am familiar with Black Lives Matter because they were um, birthed out of what the the um, the uh, decision um, for uh, Trayvon. Uh, um, and then there was another organization called Dream Defenders who sat in our governor's office. Um, over 30 days um, just to get an arrest for the person who shot and killed Trayvon. So there are groups that's out there. Um, there are new groups, it seems like, that's, that, that, that's popping up every day um, that I'm not so familiar with, but those are the ones that I'm definitely familiar with. On, on, in addition to the NAACP and the National Urban League and the uh, National Action Network and those groups. But I think people need to get more involved in those organizations and work through those organizations. Um, what is it that people can do? That was probably one of your questions. What is it that people can do to um, make sure that, um, you know, they're fighting a good fight, that they're staying woke, that they're participating in, in social, social change? Um, like I said, they have to get involved in, in, in nonprofit organizations. 
Um, you have to lend your time and your talent to those nonprofit organizations. You have to donate to those nonprofit organizations. Um, you might have to write letters. You might have to call your legislators. You might have to run for office. You might have to knock on doors or give out literature. There are different things that you can do to push the cause, but we all have to come together to find out what is what is it that we want to change what where what area because you're not going to change the world you know but we can chip at some of the things that are going on just one organization at a time and i think that that's what needs to happen um we did have a lot of uh uh organizations uniting um, in 2020, when the situation happened with George Floyd, there were a lot of rallies around what happened with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor also. But I think that we need to move to the next level. Okay, we rallied, we marched, now what? We need to make sure that we have a strategic plan in place, and this is what we take to the White House. I fully agree. I, I'm... I yeah, <laughs> I fully agree. Um, when, uh, so you started the Trayvon Martin Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about its mission and work and how um, our, our listeners and uh, guests can help support you and your um, foundation? Did somebody put, oh, thank you so much, <laughs> whoever put the website there. So I, um, because I'm not going to say everything that's on the website, so I would just encourage people to go to the website is uh, www dot trayvonmartinfoundation.org. And so I would encourage them to go there. Um, when they go there, I want people to know that um, we are, I am fighting um, not to bring Trayvon back because I already know that Trayvon is resting in heaven. He's my angel. He's looking down over me. But it's about the Trayvon Martins that you don't know. It's about the ones that you have not said their names, that you have not met their mom or their dad. Um, that, that you don't know the situation, you don't know what tragedy happened to them. I meet those people. And so I have to be passionate and deliberate about what I do because I am meeting those people, those Trayvon Martins that you don't know. In addition to our Sandra Blands that you don't know, you know, it's a, it's a lot of young ladies that are being killed, shot and killed as well. Um, the Brianna Taylors, you know, you know about the Brianna Taylors, but it's a lot of young ladies that are being shot and killed and, 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 and nobody knows their name. And so I'm very passionate and, and, and it's very important and purposeful work. But um, we celebrate Trayvon's birth and not his death. So every year around his birthday, we do what we call is a peace walk. Um, the peace walk is a short distance because we want to send a clear message that Trayvon had a right to walk in peace without being followed, chased, pursued, profiled, or killed. So we, we very deliberate about that. It's called a peace walk and a peace talk because we believe that Trayvon and our kids, our young people, and we have to be very mindful to know that Trayvon was 17 and he was unarmed. The person who was fo following him and chased him and, and, and shot and killed him was a 28-year-old neighborhood crime watch that, that was following him with a loaded gun. So that, that right there gives you intent. Um, I don't see a 28-year-old man with a loaded gun yelling for help. I definitely hear a 17-year-old yelling for help. And so I had to sit through the courtroom and listen to that several times um, that a 28-year-old man with a loaded gun was yelling for help, which is ridiculous. But nevertheless, um, the foundation, you know, sends that clear message every year um, during Trayvon's birth about um, making sure that um, we send that message out. After the uh, peace walk is a peace talk. The peace talk is basically our elected officials, pastors, our young people, um, community leaders, we bring them out and we have them talk to the audience. And it's about encouraging them, inspiring them and empowering them. It's, it's, it's not a negative, a, a bashing thing. It's about uplifting because we are going through enough. We don't need another person telling us that 
um, they've had enough, you know, that this is too much. We already know that this is too much. When we see our loved ones being shot and killed and they're unarmed, when we see our loved ones um, being shot in the back, and, and, and they're unarmed, which means they did not pose a threat to you because they didn't have a weapon and you're holding a weapon, you know? And so we got to think about our, those things. We got to think about making sure that we protect our children. Um, so that's the Peace Walk and Peace Talk. We do a fundraiser every year around his birthday. Um, and, and that fundraiser is a sit down dinner. It's a formal event. Um, we just had that as well on February 6th. Um, my birthday is February 16th, so right after that, I had my birthday. Um, I just posted the pictures, I think, this morning, but it was last Wednesday. I'm so behind on everything, <laughs> but um, we also have the Circle of Mothers, which is coming up in May. Um, it was a dream that I had because there was no organization to help me. I just was like reaching for people to help me with what I was going through and there was no organization. So I created that organization and it's called Circle of Mothers. It's on the website as well. Um, and I bring mothers in from all over the United States, um, a few from other countries, but basically from the United States. And um, initially when I started, it was about uh, uh, people who have lost children through gun violence because that's that was my uh, area. Um, now, it, it, your child could be a sickness. I've had Eric Garner's mom. It was a chokehold. I had Miss Minnie's mom, which was a car accident in Atlanta. Like, um, it's the same pain. So it's the, regardless of how your child was killed, whether it's black on black crime, whether it was a neighborhood crime watch, whether it was a police officer, it does not matter. The same pain that's in my heart is the same pain that those mothers are dealing with. And so I bring them every year. It's a weekend. And it's about healing. Um, we laugh, we cry, we do all of those things that women do. Um, but it's about moving forward. It's about moving um, to the next uh, chapter in your life. It's about healing. And the only thing I ask the moms to do is to make sure when they go back to their communities to make sure that they're helping other mothers and other families. Um, Probably every high profile of family that you can think of has attended the Circle of Mothers. And so I'm very proud of the Circle of Mothers. Tracy does a Circle of Fathers. Um, that Circle of Fathers is talking about how um, men could be better men and boys could be better boys. And it talks about, you know, just them bettering, bettering themselves. Um, we do a book bag, um, a back to school event where we give about 500 book bags away with supplies and everything. And um, every year that's growing as well. Um, we do uh, Thanksgiving baskets. We do Christmas, uh, a Christmas toy drive. Like I'm extremely busy, like the whole year, like... <laughs> Um, I'm always planning something. We just finished in February with the peace walk and peace talk in the dinner. And now I'm preparing for the circle of mothers, um, which is, I, I just absolutely love seeing the mothers because while I'm ministering to the mothers, I'm also ministering to myself. So I probably didn't say everything that's on the website, but you all go there, take a look at the website. Um, we, we only can do as much as we can based on the donations we receive. We also have merchandise um, on the website. You can buy like this nice t-shirt that I have on. I don't know if you can see it, how well you can see it. Um, you can't see it, okay. Well, I have on pants, so it's okay. I don't know if you can see it. Oh yeah, we can see it now, yeah. Okay, yeah, so I, this is our 10th year memorial um, t-shirt. Um, we just put this up last month. Um, it's a limited edition. So when we run out, we're going to, um, I don't think we're going to order again, but we have merchandise on there. We have masks, we have t-shirts, we have hoodies. Um, we have books, um, because, um, we do have a book that's out now. I'm working on my second book, um, to, to, uh, talk about, um, moving forward and talking about my next chapter. Um, so I just encourage everybody to go to the website and just take a look at some of the things that we're doing. Okay, def we definitely um, will do that. Before we open the um, 
open up the Q and A. Um, I, is there anything else that you would, you know, like the community to know? Um, you know, what would be most important for us to push forward in assisting you with with carrying on your work? Um, because you all are in Massachusetts, right? Mm -hmm. Massachusetts. Um, I would suggest that people connect with a nonprofit. Um, it, it doesn't have to be the Trayvon Martin Foundation, but that would be nice. But you are, are so far away that I would suggest they connect with a nonprofit organization and work through that nonprofit organization. Um, it's not that hard to find one that have the same goals in mind and, and you know, that they can work through in order to uh, try to come, you know, try to make a difference, try to make a change um, in society. Okay. You know, I, I you know, um, just to ad lib, a, ad lib a little bit, I will say that, um, you know, it's, I'm not originally from Massachusetts. I'm from St. Louis. So, you know, we lived, our neighborhood was like, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes from where Mike Brown was killed. You know, I think where there's a little bit of struggle here is like people tend to think that racism doesn't necessarily exist in liberal Massachusetts, right? Um, but there's a reason why they call Boston like up south, right? <laughs> so you get kind of the, kind of the same thing. So, um, you know, I think that's really helpful um, advice that you give us to work with nonprofits to continue the, the work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so with that, we can we can open up for Q and A. Um, please put your questions in the Q and A, and Jennifer and I will um, read them aloud for Miss Fulton to answer. Yeah, and if you can avoid using the chat, it's hard for us to keep track of what's happening in the chat as well as. So if you have questions, put them in the Q and A. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put your questions in the chat because I'm not reading the chat. It's too hard for me. <laughs> um, Kim, do you want to start or do you want me to? You can start. Um, so one of the questions um, is specific about how did you emotionally deal with this question comes from Katie Luders. I hopefully I'm saying your name correctly. How did you emotionally deal with the lack of accountability for Trayvon's death and, and um, expressing her uh, I'm very, so very sorry for your loss. So how, how did I deal with the... The lack of accountability in Trayvon Martin's death. So the man who murdered him was not held accountable. How, how are you, how did you handle that? Or are, are you dealing it with emotion? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still dealing with it um, because um, at some point, I think I believed in the justice system. Now I, I really don't believe in the justice system because of what happened with my son. And so I, I just think that it's, it's not just. I don't think the justice system is just. And that uh, people of color um, are at a disadvantage, um, not only when it comes to being bonded out of jail, but, but being represented by attorneys. You know, you have to have money in order to fight some of these cases. And I think we're at a disadvantage at times because of that. Um, I, I just don't believe that people were woke um, in 2012. I don't think that, um, you know, uh, and I'm not speaking about people of color because we've been woke because we've been experiencing um, ra race, racism and we've been experiencing discrimination and all of those negative, ugly terms that we thought didn't happen in the United States, but they are, they have been happening and they are happening. And Trayvon wasn't the first one to be shot and killed and um, the person wasn't held accountable, you know? And so um, I just, you know, I, I just don't believe that we were in a time where, where we was able to hold people accountable for our young people's lives, for people of color's lives. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is from Anonymous. Um, it takes a village to raise our children. We say this over and over. During the years that passed since Trayvon was unjustly taken from you and from us as well, what have we as a society done right in reaction to this crime? And how far do we have to go to prevent such senseless crimes? Okay, so let me just tell y'all, I'm exhausted 
So I'm not going to remember two questions. So just, <laughs> give, me, you know, just give me one question. So okay. the first one was, um, how, how far have we come? So I, I really believe that in my mind, I really believe that we are progressing. I really believe that. And that's because I see from the verdicts that people are being held accountable for killing people of color, where before you did not see that, you did not see an arrest, you did not see a, a, a conviction, you did not see a person go to, going to jail. Um, here in Miami, um, if, if I'm correct, it's been 28 years since our uh, uh, state attorney's office has held anybody accountable for shooting and killing a person of color. 28 years. Like, really? Like, you mean to tell me it's never happened? No, it's happened. They just haven't been charged. They haven't been arrested. They haven't been convicted. And so I, I see the two steps forward and I see the two steps back. So the two steps forward is the person being held accountable, being arrested. So now we get an arrest, you know, and we rally and we pushing for it and we getting these arrests. And now I see convictions, which is good. And now I see people um, 25 years, 30 years life. I see that where I didn't see it before. So that's the progress that we've made. But the two steps back is the fact that we lost Ahmaud Aubrey. We lost George Floyd and Trayvon Martin and Tamar Rice and Michael Brown and uh, Sandra Bland and Eric Garner and the list goes on. You see, we lost those people, but we may have moved two steps forward in the justice system, but those lives are gone and those lives are lost. And so with, with a, with, when somebody is asked that question like me who has lost a child, it's bittersweet for me. It's not all happy days because of the fact that the person is going to jail. I think about the family of the family of Oscar Grant, the family of George Floyd, the family of Breonna Taylor. I think about those families. And even if the person is, is going to jail, they're still alive. They, 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 your, your family can call, well, not, not necessarily call you, but your family can talk to you on certain days. They can visit you on certain days. They can, you can write them. They can write you. That can't happen with somebody that, that has been who, whose life has been taken, you know, senselessly. It, 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 you, it, it's, just no, it's just no connection there. And so I definitely believe that we are headed in a direction where it's accountability. And I'm going to say this until they put me in my grave, um, that it has to be accountability because this country has gotten so... Um, accustomed to people being shot and killed and nobody being held accountable. And so I'm glad we're getting to a space now where we are seeing with our own eyes that people are being held accountable. That was a great question too. Um, from Michael Dolan, um, how, fa how has this tragedy affected Javaris? Has it changed? Did it change him? Um, Javars has always been um, laid back. Um, I, I, I try to keep Vars, you know, in the loop. I keep him in the loop. Um, but I don't want him to be so engulfed in everything that's going on and everything that I'm doing because I'm, I'm like really 10 feet in, you know, I'm 10 toes in. I'm just like grounded and I don't, I want him to have some, um, some aspects of a normal life. And so I bring him in and then I kind of sit him on the sideline for a little bit because I want him to have, you know, a regular life, a normal life or some parts of a normal life. And so um, this has infected me and both him because it makes me a little edgy. Um, um, and, and it would make any parent edgy, um, but I just, you know, think about, you know, just making sure that he's covered. I, I make sure that, you know, I'm talking to him and making sure his head is right and making sure that he's meditating, he's praying, and that he's moving forward in the healing process. Um, that's the most that I could do as a parent. 
Um, Javaris and I are very close and so was I with Trayvon, but Javaris and I are, are very, very close. Um, I tell people his, his teeth look like my teeth. His legs look like my legs. Uh, he literally looks like me. And so, um, I, uh, I, um, I just see myself in him and I just want him to be healthy and happy. And, you know, I don't always bring him in because I, I want to, you know, make sure that he has a good life. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we have a question from anonymous that says, um, how can one change humanity's inability to embrace other cultures? Um, they have to try. <laughs> a lot of people don't try. I don't think hate is a, um, it's in your DNA. I think it's a learned behavior. And so if you can learn to hate, and I'm not asking anybody to love your neighbor, even though that's in the Bible to love your neighbor. I'm not asking, I'm just asking to just be respectable to your neighbor, just be courteous to your neighbor, um, just appreciate who your neighbor is, whether they are short, tall, um, whether they wear glasses, they don't, whether they have locks or their natural hair or blonde hair, just respect who that person is, whatever religion, um, they just, they choose, that's their religion. And just like with anybody else, I believe that if you have a choice, they should have a choice too. You know, who am I to tell people that you have to be Christian or you have to be Baptist or you have to be Catholic or Muslim? Who am I to tell that person that? That's a learned behavior. That's a learned, you learn to hate people for who they are. It is just that they have to unlearn it. Uh, and how do you unlearn it? You unlearn it by, by communicating with other people. I can't expect to just talk to people of color and think that I'm going to learn about other cultures. I can't possibly learn about other cultures if I'm just dealing with people of color. And so sometimes you got to step out of your box and you got to talk to people that's on the other side. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Um, I was going to say something and it completely left my head, but that's okay. Uh, from Willa Bandler, um, she's asking, uh, Father's Day is on Juneteenth this year. Any ideas for celebrating Black fatherhood, celebrating moms made me think about it? Um, my, my dad is still uh, living. And so I always just, he just likes a good dinner. You know, he he's easy to please. I always go to the mall. I get him cologne. He might wear it. He might not. I get him a shirt. He might wear it. He might not. And so I know definitely he's going to eat that shrimp dinner. He's going to eat that, you know, he's going to eat that big juicy burger. He's going to eat those, those things. But, um, I don't know. I think we should do something. Um, I don't have anything planned at this time, but that's a that's a good suggestion um, to plan something for Juneteenth and Father's Day at the same time. And, um, you know, I, uh, I think that's a, a good idea to do something. I don't have anything in mind. Like I said, I, I'm just finishing up with the peace walk and peace talk and the dinner. And now I'm in circle of mother's mood mode. And so um, I'm just thinking about, excuse me, bringing the moms in and, and what I can do for the moms. Usually Tracy does something with the dads and, you know, we always talk about bringing both the moms and dads together, but I like my frills. I like all my purple. I don't need the guys in there. Um, we laugh, we cry, we entertain, it's entertaining, but it's also work because we have to do the work um, that it takes to heal. And a lot of times um, men don't want to open up themselves so that they can heal. Women, um, we, we don't mind opening up. You know, if, if I go to the restroom right now and I see a young lady in the restroom and she's crying, I'm going to ask her, What's wrong? I might even cry with her, but that's the, the compassion in us. That's the love that's in us. That's the uh, nurturing part of women. You know, it's not that we're so sensitive and we're so emotional. It's just that we are compassionate. And so um, 
I really believe that's why the circle of mothers works. Um, it's working out so well because um, I understand that, listen, if, if we can laugh together, we can cry together. You know, we can hug each other. No, I don't know you. I didn't know you before um, you came this weekend, but I know you now and I see what you need because that's the same thing that I needed. And so um, I don't know. We, we probably do need to plan something. Who was that that asked that question? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next question is from Audrey. Um, Audrey. Audrey Hall. Thank you, Audrey. How do you suggest educating the masses about inherent racism and racial profiling? The masses. Um, <laughs> I think you take one group at a time. You, you, you start, you know, small. I speak to a lot of colleges and universities, and it's just from one step, one seminar, one, um, you know, one speaking engagement after another one. And people, um, you know, some people know that things are not where they should be and they want to make a difference. And some people feel like, okay, these things are happening, they're wrong, but I'm not going to participate. I'm not going to get involved. And so those are the people that's the problem, the ones that don't want to get involved because they know what's wrong and what's right. They see the, the uh, how disadvantaged it is for people of color and they don't wanna help. It's like, how could you not wanna help a baby or a child or an animal, somebody that is at a disadvantage? Um, how could you not wanna help them? But it's all about what's in your heart. And so it just makes us uh, work harder. The people that are more passionate about it, it just makes us work harder. But um, I think you just start with small groups. You just have small groups and small conversations, you know, nothing to upset people, but it will be a little uncomfortable because what's going on, if, if me losing my son and me talking about it makes you uncomfortable, then you're probably gonna be uncomfortable um, during my conversations, but it's okay. You know, maybe that discomfort is what causes you to wanna participate and get involved. Thank you. So I don't think we, we try to handle the masses. I think we talk to one specific group or one specific organization at a time and we go from there. Thank you. Um, and I think this um, kind of relates to what I was gonna ask before or what I was gonna say before. You had mentioned um, when someone said, how do we embrace other cultures? And you had mentioned that you know teaching starts at home and I wanna be, um, I just want to point out as I'm an educator in an affluent district, but we have a very diverse um, group of students from many different countries. And um, some of the things that people start with at home is like telling their kids that something else that someone else eats is gross, right? So they see sushi, eating raw fish is gross. Don't ever do that, right? And then that child is being taught that some, how they eat or what they do is better than how someone else does it, which makes them think that they can go tell someone else what to do as they get older. So you can tell your neighbor they shouldn't be mowing their lawn when it's really none of your business, right? Um, so this next question from an anonymous attendee says, how can we help as adults, especially in the white majority, um, which um, I just have to say the majority of the global majority is people of color, <laughs> but that's fine. Um, but how can we help, especially in the white majority, to be active um, advocates for racial justice? Um, and how do we educate them on the issues? And I'm before you answer, I would like to just remind people that you need to do work within yourself. It's not just the Black moms who are going to um, uh, circle of mothers that need to do the work on themselves. It's everyone needs to do that work on themselves. I need to do that work on myself. So before you start educating another group, make sure you're doing the work on yourselves. But it, but for you, Ms. Fulton, how would you ask for white active advocates? Um, it, it's a, it's about mindset. Like, um, I don't think it is necessarily um, deals with the laws. I don't think it necessarily deals with religion. I think it's about mindset because whatever religion you are, um, wherever you are in life, um, there's a certain point in time where you should you should have learned right and wrong. You should have learned um, don't be disrespectful to people. Um, 
I tell people all the time, I don't like frogs. I don't like frogs. I live in a, 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 a tropical um, place, but I don't like frogs. They, they ugly, they big, and they hop on you and things like that. So I don't like frogs. And so people always laugh when I say that. Um, but the thing about it is, I wouldn't go out and get a stick and kill a frog. I just want him to leave me alone. Like I want, I want us to stay in the same community, but you mind your business, little frog, and I'll mind my business. I'm not going to hurt that frog. I'm not going to kill that frog. I'm not going to shoot the frog. I'm not going to do any of those things to that frog. You see, it, it starts with your mindset. But guess what? I don't like the frog. <laughs> you know, I don't like him. You, you know, but I'm, I'm able to live in the same community with the frogs. We have a problem with iguanas. You guys know what those are? Those are big lizards. Ours look like alligators, some of them. Don't they fall out of the sky when it reaches like 50 degrees? <laughs> when it gets cold, they, they fall to the ground. But by then, we if you live in Florida, you already in the house anyway. So when they fall in, you, you're not outside anyway, because 50 is cold for us. But back to my, my, my point, it's about mindset. You know, it's about mindset. How do you expect to think something, think a thought or, or have a certain belief and feel that you can hate the person so much that you want to harm them, you want to hurt them, or you want to kill them because of who they are? But what if the tables were turned and somebody is looking at them in that same particular manner? That's why I say it's about mindset. It's about changing minds. And I think that when people know that something is wrong and you continue to support something that you know is wrong, then you are a part of the problem. Indeed. Um, our next question, and my apologies if I mispronounce your name, um, Sachi Karmachara. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and experience with us, Mrs. Fulton. I'm a teacher of young children at a private school in Massachusetts. What can our school community do to make a difference within our school community and within our greater community towards human rights and social justice? Um, I think that even within the classroom. So first you start with each class and then you start with that particular school and then you start with the district and then you start with the region and it just catches on. You have to have conversations that address these issues. You have to talk about people just being respectable to each other, being courteous to each other, regardless of what the person looks like, regardless of the, the person's educational level, regardless of any of those things, we got to go back to the basics and we got to teach our kids right from wrong. We got to teach our kids what's good and what's bad, what they should and should not do, because now it seems like they don't know. So I believe we need to start there. And then you talk about not necessarily civil rights, but just like you said, human rights. It's, it's, it's the right to be human. It's the right to live without being harassed, without being followed, chased, profiled, killed. You know, you, you got to be comfortable in your own country. We have a lot of people, um, African-Americans, and not just our young men, but our young ladies as well, that don't even feel comfortable in our own country. This is our country. And a lot of people say, well, go back to your country. Well, this is the country that I was born in. This is what my birth certificate say, you know? And so people try to tell you, oh, well, you, you're African. You need to go back to Africa. Most African-Americans have never been to Africa. Do people really understand that? <laughs> and so you're not taking me back to some place that I'm familiar with that I've been. You're taking me back to some place that my ancestors were from. 
And so we got to educate each other. We got to start with, with little forums such as this, and we got to educate each other. And we and, and it doesn't take a lot. Like, I don't need you to understand what happened with my son. I just need you to understand what's right and what's wrong. I just need you to understand that Trayvon belonged to somebody and, and, and he was 17 years old and he was unarmed and you had a 28 year old man with a loaded gun that was chasing him. We have to protect our children. Thank you. Um, from an anonymous attendee, uh, what do you think about the gun laws in America? Everybody uh, anonymous. <laughs> I, <know>. um, <laughs> I, I don't think it's um, a problem with the gun laws. I think it's a problem with the gun owners um, because guns don't kill people. Um, people kill people. And so I think the gun owners need to be better educated. Um, and I, I don't have anything against the castle doctrine. I think that you should be able to protect your home and your property and things like that. But by the same token, I don't believe you should shoot anybody in the back. I don't believe that a person should be on the ground and you're shooting the person that's on the ground um, because it's clear that that person is trying to flee from you and, and out of anger or hatred that you shot this person in the back. So I, I believe that people should uh, have a right to bear arms. Um, I grew up with a gun in my house. Um, people say all the time that I do not like uh, police officers, but my dad is a retired police officer. He was a police officer for the city of Miami. So it's impossible for me to hate police officers. And so a lot of people don't know that. They don't understand that. And they don't care. They just say, oh, well, she doesn't like police officers. No, I grew up with a gun in my house and I never touched my dad's gun never touched, never had, was curious enough to say, okay, I'm going to pick this up. And so we have to teach our young people that, um, but we have to make sure that we're dealing with people and their mindset as a whole. Um, but I, I don't have a problem with uh, gun, gun laws. It's the gun owners. Right. So we have a question here. Um, I'll try to keep it brief because there are multiple questions within this one question. I'm, I'm only one question. I know. That's what I'm saying. I'm going to. I'm going to. the one that if, from anonymous oh, attendee one, at 752. So I, I asked one of them already. Yeah. So the one question, um, you know, when you're, when you're talking with other moms who are facing the immediate and senseless death of their own child, um, what do you say to them? <laughs> I don't always talk about what I say to them, but I try to encourage them. Um, one of the things that um, I went through is I, I felt that I would never be happy again. I felt that I never would smile again. Um, and so I, I talked to them about, you know, what I've been through and, and, you know, the fact that, yes, you are down right now, but you can definitely get back up. But it takes effort. It takes um, a willingness to say, okay, I, I fail, but I'm not going to stay down here. I fail, but I want to get back up. And, and sometimes um, moms don't want to do the work that it entails for you to get back up because it's very hard. It's tedious. It's, it's like, I, I just need somebody to lift me. I need somebody to hold my hand. I need somebody to walk me through it. And, and at, at some point in time, you will have somebody to do all those things to assist you. But what about when nobody's around and you want to get back up? You have to learn how to uh, um, encourage ourselves. We have to learn how to motivate ourselves. We have to teach ourselves how to move to the next step. Um, and, 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 and that's, a, that's a big problem, you know. Um, so I talk to them sometimes, um, you know, I go to uh, one of the cities or states and, and if I see the mom doesn't want to talk, then I don't talk. We sit there. If she cries, I might cry too. It depends on what mood I'm, I'm in. If, if sometimes I just hug her and I don't say anything. You know, but just the mere fact that they see that I was able to move forward, I was able to 
um, um, you know, try to figure out what my new normal was. Um, they, they feel like they can do it too, because I tell them all the time, listen, I'm not a superwoman. You know, the same thing that I did is the same thing you can do, but you, you, you have to put the effort in, you have to put the work in. And then of course, unfortunately, you have some people that are never going to come back, you know, come back from what they've gone through. Thank you. And Kim, I'm sorry for interrupting before I thought it was Anyway, um, so this question is from Lisa, Lisa Abasta, Abasta, hopefully I said that right. Um, deepest sympathies from my heart. While there was zero justice or accountability for your son here on earth, do you feel that in the afterlife justice will be served? And if so, does that bring you any comfort? <laughs> that doesn't bring me any comfort now. Um, I, I just believe that um, there are, you know, so many family members in heaven with Trayvon that he's being taken care of. When, when he first um, was shot and killed, I felt that every child, um, you need your parent, you need your mom. Who doesn't need their mom? Like, um, <laughs> I, I just figured that he needed me, you know, and I figured he wasn't going to be able to, you know, function without me because he was so used to depending on me. And so um, I got past it. Um, there's this little thing that um, Dr. Phil um, taught me about, you know, he told me that every time I cried that uh, Trayvon was holding a candle and every time I cried, his candle would go out. And I don't know why it worked, but it definitely worked. And I, so I would tell myself, I don't want Trayvon's candle to go out. So it was times that I wanted to cry that I didn't because I didn't want his candle to go out. It's, it's strange, but it made sense at the time for me. And that was probably, probably a, so many years ago, like when it, when it, when he was first shot and killed. And I was like, and, and my mom didn't understand what I was saying either. And I was saying, oh no, I don't want Trayvon's candle to go out. And she was like, well, what, what are you talking about? And I was, I told her, I said, well, Dr. Phil said if I cried, Trayvon's candle is going to go. And she had no clue what I was talking about. So um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I really can't answer that question right now. Okay. Um, so here's a question, I think, this is, again, anonymous. Um, you guys are very um, secretive tonight. Um, but um, this is a, a question near and dear to, to my heart, and probably most of us who have listened to, listened to you tonight and also over the years seen you work. When do you have time or take off? Um, Self-care self is extremely important. So when do you, when do you take a break? So I... I, I, I this Saturday would be 10 years. February 26, 2012 um, would be 10 years. I'm sorry, 10 years that Trayvon was shot and killed. And so I have been just extremely busy the whole month of February. Like I, I was able to take like a day here and a day there. Um, but normally I take time out for myself. I can, I can feel when the burden is too heavy. I can feel when things are overwhelming. I can feel because I know my body and I know, okay, it's time to go to the spa and get a massage. It's time to put my, my feet in the sand at the beach and just listen to music. It's, it's, it's time to go shopping. It's time to exercise. It's time to go eat uh, a seafood dinner with a nice drink it's just I, I i know it is but because it's been february and february is like one of my busiest months other than december um i've just been going and going and going but i just i see saturday in the horizon and i just believe that after saturday things will come, uh, settle back down like i've been doing a lot of media um and 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 in addition to the events that we had at the beginning of the month, um, I went to dinner and celebrated my birthday, which I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta go now. I ate my steak. I ate my lobster tail. Now I, I need to go. I gotta, you know, and so um, I'll take time for myself. And that's one of, that's a very important um, aspect to grieving is to make sure you practice self-care. And I do normally, it's just, this is just a busy month for me. And um, after Saturday, I'm going to just 
unwind and take some time out. Well, I, I'm glad to hear that. Um, I just have to go back up to the question. Um, so this question comes from, um, oh, this is not a question. It's a comment from Liz Colvin. Sabrina, thank you so much for being here this evening. You describe your love for your children so eloquently and dearly. Your message about hope, optimism, and grassroots level purposeful work is truly inspirational. Thank you. Um, and the question from Leslie White Harvey is I'm a newly elected vice chair of Framingham Public Library trustees. Thank you for your work. What advice do you give, do you have to help libraries to elevate the work and help get allies to join in the work? Read the question again. What advice do you have to help libraries to elevate the work that you're doing and help allies to join in the work? I, I don't know. I don't know um, about libraries specifically. Um, we do have a book called Rest in Power, The Enduring Life of Trayvon Martin. And so it's written um, every other chapter, uh, Tracy and I alternate chapters. Um, and that's because so many people was talking about who Trayvon Martin was and they really didn't know him that um, our in attorneys encourage us to write a book in addition to the literary agents that we have encourage us to write a book. So we definitely have a book. Um, I would um, suggest that the book is put, uh, you purchase the book and the book is in the library so that people um, could, could know who Trayvon Martin was through the speaking of his parents and not just people who didn't know him. Um, but we do have a lot of people that support us. And so I, I'm, I'm just happy for that. But I think how you, uh, as far as the foundation and as far as the library and organizations, um, support comes um, by people who have the same um, goals and benefits in mind. So all you should do at the library is just reach out and um, see who wants to support you, who wants to partner with you, who wants to um, sponsor events that you do. And that's how we do with the uh, uh, Trayvon Martin Foundation. It's not like we necessarily like call people up and say, listen, will you support this? We you know, see which organizations um, have the same goals in mind. Are, are they fighting justice or are they, um, you know, supporting somebody who is um, killing um, people and, and not being held accountable? Are they, you know, we, we kind of look at those things and we, that's where our support comes from. Okay, thank you. I want to remind everyone that we are a little less than 10 minutes. Um, Toward the close of our towards the close of the program, um, so we'll take a few more questions. Um, so this question is from Gaye Aspinar. Um, actually, her husband. I'm sorry, I can't um, I can't read his name. But the question was, can we have social justice without economic justice? And um, he wonders what you think about reparations. That's too many questions. I ain't gonna read. Okay. Them. Um, so the first one was, can we have economic? Can we have social justice without social economic justice, justice? Without economic justice. Let me just think about that for a moment. Um, I think they go hand in hand. To me, I think they go hand in hand. And I think it, um, social justice um, it, it is, is about people being treated fairly. And, and I think a, a lot of times when we talking about, you know, economics, it, it's about people who are not being treated fairly a, as well. So I think they go hand in hand as far as I'm thinking right now in my mind. Okay. Thank you. Um, sorry. Good job. Um from Malala. I have to go like this when I'm reading. Yeah, I know. I'm getting to that age. Um, uh, from Malala, um, Kitayam, whoops, Kitayimba, Kitayimba, hopefully. Um, it was mentioned in the conversation that there are certain cities and areas in each state 
where there are people who just don't believe racism exists. Boston's one of them. What is your advice to approaching someone who doesn't believe racism exists today? So like I said, um, I only like, I'm, I'm not trying to convince anybody anything because sometimes you have to say what you need to say. You have to speak your truth and then you have to leave some people where you find them because they don't want to change. They don't want to know that racism still exists. They don't, they think that everybody is equal or they want to believe that we are all equal um, when they see in front of them that it's not. And so how could you believe you're not living in reality if you continue to watch the news, if you continue to watch uh, read uh, social media posts, if you continue to watch, uh, read the newspaper and you continue to see these things occurring and yet you still say that racism does not exist, then you're living in a shell, you're living as an ostrich with your head in the sand and you just don't want to believe what's real. And so those people, I don't spend much time trying to convince. I leave those people with where I find them. It's just like when you are a certain religion and you convincing, you're trying to convince somebody that your religion, your religion is the best religion. <laughs> you know, it's like you can tell them and that's it. You leave it right there. And, and they have to make a decision on if they believe what you're saying or not, you know, but if you see um, racism existing, if you see uh, uh, people are struggling with um, home ownership, with housing and things like that, and you continue to say, oh, well, there's not a housing problem, then you, you, you live in with, with your head in the sand and you just don't, you know, just not live in a realistic life. And we have to leave you right there where you are because it's about mindset. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Val Harris. Um, how has your husband, um, Trayvon's father, handled the situation? Um, who said that Val Harris? Val Harris. Mm -hmm. Ms. Harris, I don't have a husband. Okay. That um, so I think she, it may be um, Trayvon's dad. That's what she meant. That's yeah, what Tracy. She meant. Yeah, Trayvon's dad. She didn't mean to say husband. See, I'm not married, <laughs> but um, that's my ex-husband. Um, he's handling it uh better than he was. So he's healing. He continues to grieve. He is. He's doing interviews right now for um the 10th year memorial. Um, he, he's present, um, with the foundation. So he was there on February 5th and 6th for the events that we do. Um, I'm, I'm working more with the foundation because I'm, I'm running the foundation. I'm the, the director of the foundation and I'm, um, handling the day-to-day -day operations. Um, so I communicate with him a lot. Um, he's on the board, but I communicate with him a lot about decisions um, that I need to make and decisions that are being made as it relates to the foundation. Um, but he is healing. I definitely, I'm, I'm definitely going to say that he's healing. He's um, progressing in his, um, in his walk with the grieving process. Thank you. Um, this might be one of the last last questions, and it kind of ties into one of the questions we had as a, as panelists. Um, so this comes from Val Harris Aileen. Um, good good evening, Sora Fulton. I am a member of a local chapter of De Delta Sigma Theta. Thank you for your service to the community. What Wait, do you want for Val? Oh, there you go. Okay, Val. <laughs> um, what do you want your legacy to be when you leave this earth? And my follow-up question would be how- I'm going to answer the follow-up okay. question. I'm not yeah. going to read it. Okay. I'm what not... would you like your legacy to be when, you're, when your time here is done? 
I want I want to say this. I, I I don't really believe it's about my legacy. I believe it's about Trayvon's legacy. I am working on Trayvon's legacy. I want people to know um, that here in the United States that a 17 year old that's unarmed that wasn't committing any crime was shot and killed and 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 died uh, at the hands of a 28 year old man with a loaded gun who chased him followed him, profiled him, and killed him, that this still happens here in the United States. And so um, even though you have probably people on the other side that want to forget who Trayvon Martin um, was, um, we're never going to forget who Trayvon Martin was because it, it happened. It, it's just like um, Emmett Till. It's just like um, Mike Brown and Sandra Bland. We're never going to forget some of those names that we've heard. And so I just want people to know that. I want people, you know, to know that it's not about my legacy. It's about the fact that my son wasn't here to speak for himself. And so his mom decided she had to speak for him. Um, much like Mamie Till um, felt like she sh she needed to show the world what happened with her son and to be the voice of uh, of her son who had been shot and who had been um, beaten to death and thrown in water with uh, a rock on his foot. But um, I think it, it it it's about moving forward. It's about uh, you know making sure that that message is out there so that we can try to address the ugly truth because that is the ugly truth. You know, people don't want to believe it. Um, um, they want to believe that Trayvon was killed because he was wearing a hoodie. No, Trayvon was killed because of the color of his skin. And so we have to deal with that. We have to have conversations around that. In order for us to resolve that issue, we have to deal with it. And for a long time, it was a hard, hard for me to say it because I felt it was because of the hoodie because that's what the media said. It was because of the hoodie. But when I look around um, and I'm in the airport and I'm at uh, different colleges and university, everybody's wearing that hoodie, and including Jennifer. Uh, but a lot of times, um, you know, it's not just our young men, but it's our, also our young ladies. I remember um, 10 years ago, it was um, Anderson Cooper that said, listen, I wear a hoodie almost every day when, when I do my walk or when I ride my bicycle and nobody look at me as being suspicious. I believe that because he's he's a, a white guy with blue eyes. You know, Trayvon is a uh, was a black kid with brown eyes. You know, and so it, it was no other reason. It was no other reason for him to follow Trayvon. It was no other reason for him to do anything but call nine one nine one one and wait for the police. He had no business. Um, um, stopping Trayvon or trying to detain Trayvon or trying to speak with Trayvon about anything. And so we have to protect our children. We have to know that if you have a 17-year-old or you know of a 17-year-old, that there should never be a time when a 28-year-old man is following a 17-year-old. Oh, I wasn't finished. <laughs> um, it's also about... Uh, um, trying to prevent gun violence. It's about um, educating the gun owners. It's about just uh, empowering our young people. I truly believe that um, it's our young people that's going to make the positive change that we want to see. Thank you for that. Um, and, you know, before you go, um, is there anything like, you know, your book, we have a question about from Christopher Clark. Um, where can we find your book? Uh, we have the, the link to the Trayvon Martin Foundation in the chat for everyone. Um, I know your book is, is in bookstores, Rest in Power. It's on Amazon. It's in our local public libraries. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's also on the website. Um, like I said, a lot of the uh, donations that people buy merchandise, they buy books, they buy uh, hoodies, they buy t-shirts, they buy masks, the different things that they buy. Um, it, it helps the foundation to continue to do the work in these streets. Um, 
um, some people don't want to buy the merchandise and they just want to donate. Um, that's a, a good thing too, because we can use that in order to travel to different cities in order for us to print material up and, and you know, and different things like that. Um, also, in addition to the book, we did um, have a docu-series with uh, Sean Carter, and I didn't say Jay-Z. Jay-Z is a stage name. It was Sean Carter. We, uh, he was the executive producer on um, Rest in Power. It's a docu-series. It, it aired on BET and Paramount Network, so you guys could pull that up. It's a six-part series. Very hard to watch. You're not going to watch it. And, and and not feel some type of emotions. It's very riveting, it's very powerful, but it's very truthful. And so um, that is something that we suggest um, that people uh, take a look at. But everything is on the website. If you go to the website, um, everything is on the website. Okay, thank you. So, you know, we, we want to be mindful of the time, everyone, and thank you for, for joining us. We would like Ms. Fulton to go get some much deserved rest. Um, I'd like to close out with um, actually a message that we got in the Q&A from Dorothy Stoneman. She is a Belmont resident and I, I thought that this summed up a closing nicely. Um, it has been beautiful to listen to Sabrina Fulton tonight, her wisdom, loving kindness, clarity about right and wrong, commitment to humanity and her never ending love for her son and to ending racism and all prejudices through deep communication with people one by one and through small groups and her appreciation for nonprofits work and so much more. Thank you very, very much for joining us here in Massachusetts tonight during this busy month of February. Thank you very much for sharing so much and so openly and wisely with us. And thank you for having me. I really appreciate the invitation for me to just speak about um, my son 10 years later. Thank you. Thank you very much.